And so it's my great pleasure to welcome those here live in the uh, Fenner Seminar Room, but I believe we've got 33 uh, online as well. So thank you for beaming in. So this is the first of a series of new uh, affiliate seminars that we plan here at the Fenner School uh, along a thematic line. And the idea is that every three months or so, uh, a number of our fabulous affiliates who have particular expertise in a, in a theme or a discipline will present some short presentations together uh, to provoke us to think more broadly about the issues that they are working on. And so we thought we would um, uh, kick off this new approach uh, with three of our favorite uh, honorary professors uh, here at Fenner School talking about uh, ecology and vegetation management and so forth. Uh, and so I have the immense pleasure in introducing them to come and give brief 15 minute presentations. Uh, because of the logistics of flipping backwards and forwards between uh, questions on Zoom and live, what we'd like you to do is save any questions uh, to the last 15 minutes uh, session where we will have all questions uh, at the end rather than on the way through. With that, let me introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Professor Sue McIntyre, who's had a, uh, a wonderful career with CSIRO and uh, now more broadly in uh, vegetation ecology and conservation. I first met Sue on a ministerial advisory committee where she was a great voice of reason. And I'm delighted to um, uh, have her present today, Sue. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. I won't um, say who the minister was on that committee. <laughs> he still lives. <coughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and thank you all people who are online. Um, my title, as you can see, Tree Thinning for Biodiversity. Uh, some, at the end of this talk, some of you may wish to perhaps suggest a, a, an alternate name, perhaps a golf ecologist bumbles beyond area of expertise <laughs> or additional cracks in the brittle and inadequate provisions that are failing to protect our landscapes today. But what I'm aiming to do is to provide a reasoned argument for more active management of land when it's being transitioned from farming to conservation management. Um, the perspective I bring is from having worked across a whole range of landscapes and more importantly, a whole range of land uses. And in the last 15 years, uh, my partner John Lewis and I have been working to restore a 200 year old sheep paddock. I, the sheep went 200 years. <laughs> the, pad, the sheep had been running for 200 years. Uh, and we are trying to restore this back to a functioning woodland and forest ecosystem, aiming for high quality vegetation and fauna habitat. Always happens, doesn't it? Does this need to be turned on? Use that if necessary. Is it frozen? There we go. Okay. Oh, well, it's now. I just needed a kick start. <clears throat> Do passive approaches to conservation benefit the whole species assemblage? That's the question um, that I'm posing, and um, I would suggest not always. Uh, John and I were pitched into formally addressing the question of tree thinning in the process of negotiating a management plan that's linked to a conservation covenant that we're trying to put on the land. Um, and by not including the option of tree thinning, not only we would, would we not be able to do it, which we wanted to, but subsequent owners wouldn't either. But there was no precedent of allowing tree thinning in the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust agreements. So we actually got flipped into a very rapid exercise in actually trying to work out um, what 
this meant and, and how do you develop actually explicit guidelines, which is always much harder than you think. It's easier to wave your arms around and say, yeah, we'll do a bit of tree thinning. Uh, but before I get into the nitty gritty of that, I just want to um, uh, address the issue of is, you know, why and when and is tree thinning an issue? Um, I argue that in conservation practice and theory, nothing has been so consistently ignored as the role of nutrients in previous land use history and the way that land use history determines the tree dynamics and patterns of, land, of plant diversity. And I'm going to walk you through some of this. So we're talking about eucalypt wood um, forest and woodland transitions. We start out with um, this notion that we're that conservation is about achieving some kind of state that approximates um, pre-European um, <coughs> management or pre-European structure and composition. Uh, but the uh, the uh, disturbance regime that operated then doesn't exist now and many things have happened to that pre-European vegetation in the intervening hundreds of years. The post-European, the, the pre-European post-benchmark, if you like, is some sense of trying to imagine what pre-European vegetation was like and to find actually real life examples on the ground. And there's many, uh, an event that has happened between those two things. Uh, this, this says 200 years of, oh, the whole can tell you, no, I can't, I can't even read it, 200 years of occupation intensification. Um, so initially when we first arrived as um, invaders of this land, uh, we grazed with livestock. Then as our um, technology advanced, we uh, cleared, um, hard one clearing, and grazing and then more um, mechanical clearing. Then we introduced the technology of nutrients and produced fertilised pastures. Uh, and then with uh, the ability to um, cultivate and so on, we developed more intensive land use, the most intensive land use on our landscapes, crops and so on pastures. So if we come into, uh, take a piece of land that's had one of these four uh, land use histories uh, and think, well, let's turn it into a conservation reserve. What happens? If there's only been grazing, in fact, you've lost very few of the, um, of the floristic components and um, you're probably going to get closer to the uh, pre-European condition. Uh, with clearing, of course, um, it's a little bit different. And uh, when you add fertiliser, uh, you really can't uh, do anything but deal with weeds. Uh, until the phosphorus declines. And often that's not recognised sufficiently when people ex and look at um, the, the transitions back to conservation. But what does happen when the phosphorus declines is you get dense regeneration around existing trees and the same thing in clear pastures. And so this is quite a different situation um, in terms of reaching some sort of benchmark. Uh, and so we're looking at, well, where, what, where do we go from here to get to something? Do we want something approaching benchmark? Well, generally people are saying yes. Um, but what do you do when you get in a situation? The, the uh, message about nutrients is no better illustrated than these two um, different parts of the same landscape in the Yass River Valley. Uh, the, the top one is a, um, a sheep cam, so it's had lots of imported nutrients and you can see the trees are, are dying and we've watched them die year after year. There's only one live tree left there now. And uh, below is a, a, an area where there has obviously been um, less nutrients or at least they've uh, dropped back down again and the, the orange stem that it, uh, indicates this. And you can see the really, really dense regeneration um, around the existing trees. I think many people have a perception of our landscapes like this, and we and, and it's all about trying to get trees back. You can see dieback, no regeneration, and um, and we have this notion of helplessness. So we can't do anything unless we thicken, we plant, and um, not recognizing where you have got natural capacity and where you haven't. Um, 
And there's a really interesting um, point that was made by Bob Johnson and a, a Queensland ecologist where they really do understand tree regeneration because they haven't fertilised their pastures to any great extent. And essentially he's pointed out this idea, there's a very narrow flip between a tree decline problem and a tree regeneration problem because unless your trees are actually establishing at the rate, exactly the rate at which the existing trees are, it's either going to decline or decrease. Uh, and that's, I think, a really conceptually very important idea that, um, that you don't necessarily just leave things as they are because you will, you could get what you don't want. Um, so trees do self thin. I'm not suggesting for a moment they don't, uh, but when uh, the the systems are fairly um, low fertility and the trees are pretty even aged and growing at the same rate, that tree thinning rate can be extremely slow. And we can't always tell you how slow it is because we can't really age, age trees very much. Uh, and I'll just go to this one. And this is a sort of an example of, um, of this is a really small tree. We call this a pole tree, but it's already got termite, a termite hollow. So I'm not suggesting I know how old that tree is, but it is indicating that um, these trees can be standing there for a very long time. This is that same, that different forest, but the same species. Um, when I, I've, I've watched this um, stand look exactly the same for now 15 years, it's not ours, it's down the road. Um, it's a habitat refuge. But I think is that really the habitat, the ideal habitat for either the plants or the fauna in that, that sort of landscape? And where's, where's it going to go? So we have been fiddling around with trees thinning on our place. And so we have sort of quite a, a long time looking at what doing what we're doing and the responses. The reason we do it is that I believe that you will get faster development of trees and hopefully that will hasten the um, development of, of mature trees and, and hollows, which is a huge limiting factor in these landscapes because so few trees were left. Um, I rather like the idea of mid-level perching opportunities if I, okay, if I can get there. Um, I'm also concerned that the young trees will bring fire up into the crowns of the mature trees. And also we can see with this acacia regeneration in a recently cleared patch that um, you do get an opening up uh, and the capacity for the understory to regenerate. Uh, however, there's a much more complex story because the understory will develop, but the grazing that is associated with um, dense forests can be extremely high. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a comparison of two, um, sides of the fence. This is the fenced area where we've, we've cleared trees and you can see there's an incredible diversity of orchids and things we didn't even know were, were there in any number. And this is the outside that's remained grazed. Um, so it's, it's not a really, really simple issue, but the development of the understory I consider a really major um, thing that has to be uh, worked upon in these sort of landscapes. You can use the trees for um, for treating soil erosion, as you can see here, we've done that. And the um, fallen bits of wood also provide microbial um, diversity. <coughs> and um, for people, um, we, we use firewood and we always prefer, we won't pick up fallen limbs. We cut our trees down because we think that's a more benign way of using wood. Um, the other critical thing is you start thinking about things a lot more carefully when you're actually actively having to do stuff. And I know people when they buy land, and we're talking mainly about private land for this sort of issue, um, the first thing they want to do is something. And if you don't give them something to distract that, the first thing they think of is free range pigs or pastured poultry. <laughs> and you can imagine how. <coughs> so, the opportunity for creative landscaping and, 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 and managing for structural diversity, I think is really high and really positive. Also, it's good work. It's hard work and um, that's self-limiting as long as you're not using machinery. 
So we worked out some benchmarks based on the existing database, which there were no local ones, and we um, developed some, we identified areas where we knew the management history was fairly benign, but had the most mature trees in it, essentially. So this is a TSR from um, around where we live. This is a, a, a stringy bark forest <coughs> and a um, manifera forest. Um, and these are the, this is what we came up with, uh, ecological thinning, only where number of stems exceed the benchmarks, stem density is all done at 0.1 hectare, only trees of less than or equal to 25 centimetre DBH to be thin, repeated thinning, which is really critical, people have thought actually we only need to do it once, but if you understand the dynamics, you know that's not correct. Um, and subject to less than 5% of the total um, conservation area um, to be thin annually and reviewing, most importantly. So these are the um, benchmarks that, um, that we came up with. So the, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the large trees aren't allowed to be thinned, but um, these were what we had, in, um, these are anyway. It's too complicated to explain in the time available. But essentially, these are the benchmarks, the non-bracketed ones for, this is the minimum number that we have to leave in a one hectare plot for the grassy woodlands and for the dry sclerophyll forest. The numbers in brackets are what actually are in our dry sclerophyll forest on average. So you can see the level of, of thinning that might be permitted. That's fine. And, um, uh, and you can see that the, um, the, the mature trees are in the order of 10 or 5. These are based on um, not, they wouldn't let us see the benchmarks for the um, greater than 30%, but these are taken from our, our benchmark data. Uh, and so that's pretty reasonable. So we're pretty happy with that and we have to, of course, do it to see how it's all going. Um, I just want to point out, it's a largely self, if you think people are going to go mad, it's a largely self-limiting activity because it's very hard work. And I have a great deal of gratitude to John who won't let me near a chainsaw because I'm way too unreliable um, and made me justify the cutting down of every single pole size you believe that we've ever cut down here. And, um, but it's been a very interesting journey and, and we hope that we'll come up with some good measurements about how it's going and how it works in the coming years. Thank you. So thank you, most uh, thought provoking. I might have to borrow John to <laughs> sort out a couple of uh, grassy woodland sites around town, I think, after seeing that. So our next uh, presenter is another one of our wondrous uh, honorary professors. Uh, he is somebody, who I've never told him this, actually had quite an influence on me when I first moved to Darwin as a young fella and saw his scientific paper on uh, the invasive grasses being brought in by agricultural agencies and stuffing up the ecosystems of Northern Australia. And it made me appreciate how much uh, good science can be uh, important for uh, policy change and practice. So uh, Professor Mark uh, Bonstiles had a distinguished career in CSIRO, uh, in uh, entomology, became chief of the, the Division of Ecosystem Sciences. Uh, and uh, it's such a pleasure to have him here now at the Temp School. Oh, we just check what's working down here too. Good Well, thank, thanks very much for having me. And um, you can see I've, um, I want to focus on the human aspects of invasive plants uh, today. But um, I just want to start with a with a bit of a historical case study because it does help us to understand how far we've come. So when um, back in the um, back in the early 80s, um, invasive 
plants as a conservation issue were, were hardly on the radar screen. There, was a, there, were, there were some academic publications, but it really wasn't um, a, a policy issue for conservation departments. And so uh, I, was, I, I arrived in Darwin in 1984 um, to work on Mimosa pigra, the, the, the giant sensitive plant, as a, um, it, it, it was then regarded as a, as a weed of, of uh, pastures, extensive pastures. Uh, so that was, that was the source of my funding, was from primary industries. Um, I was employed by CSIRO to work on it in, the, in that context. So what had happened was you had massive populations of the feral Asian water buffalo uh, overgrazing the big tropical floodplains of the, of the top end. You can see that 1978 picture, which was, uh, you can see some mimosa pigra, the prickly shrub there in the, in the 1978 picture with that tree stump there. Just three years later, on that fertile um, denuded soil, um, Mimosa had basically taken over the, the floodplains and you had 30 or 40,000 hectares uh, within three years. So that it was facilitated by the buffalo and by, the, by the, the capacity of the seeds to float. So by the late 80s, um, it was clearly going to be a major threat to Kakadu National Park. And all of a sudden, this groundswell of concern about weeds as a threat to conservation was becoming a, um, a, a major issue. So, so we go for it to make sure this is sure. properly online. Okay. So I'll just pause um, for a technical intervention. So sure well, I, I might do an advert while we're waiting. YouTube into influencer as I am. <laughs> 33 followers. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Is this coming off my time, man? So it's not, you think it's not on the feed? Yeah, oh, um, you are, but it's not um, sharing the screen. So yeah. I'm just trying to figure out why that is. I might just have to continue. Yeah. Let's see if I can go to the other side. That's right. Okay, so <clears throat> why, why do I use the term it's a, a human problem? The reality is a lot of people don't realise how, how much plant invasions result from intentional introductions. Um, Dick Mack and, and I, um, uh, 20 years ago, um, divided the introductions into, into three phases, which are largely overlapping. But um, So from the colonial era, beginning around AD 1500, um, you had an accidental phase where seeds were just being moved uh, willy-nilly as, as contaminants in, in other uh, commodities. Um, probably mimosa was an accidental introduction, for example, to the, to the top end. Um, uh, although its first occurrence was around botanic gardens there. Um, then um, there was a utilitarian phase, the attempt to introduce species to, um, to improve uh, and, and amplify agriculture. And then we have the sort of the frivolous aesthetic phase um, that comes in as people try to recreate uh, their, their homeland in the, uh, in the new, newly uh, colonized, invaded country. Um, so, just for an example, uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to the, uh, the paper that so inspired Jamie uh, all those years ago. It's great, great that um, I'm, I've, I've been able to do that for you, Jamie. And really, it was nothing. Um, the, the, um, but as an example of the utilitarian phase, we have this re-engineering of tropical Australia that was attempted a bit like a bit like terraforming in a science fiction film. That the idea was to turn those northern landscapes into more productive um, pastoral grazing land for for cattle. So the idea was to bring in um, bring in 
bulk uh, carbohydrate in the form of African grasses and to introduce more nutrients into the system or nitrogen through, through legumes mostly from South America. So you can see the blue squares there are the, the sites of testing and release, uh, focusing on the, the top end in particular. Um, but what ended up out of that process of introducing nearly 500 species was four useful species and 60 weeds. Um, so not a tremendous uh, outcome, as I think you'll agree. The, the, the weeds were, uh, it, this was simply a matter of uh, going through the various weed floras of the time and, and uh, working out which species were on and comparing it with the list of species that had been uh, previously introduced. But an example is, is one that's still with us now as a major issue, gamba grass in the top end. Um, it's a big perennial African grass that's replaced the, um, the, 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 the annual grass sorghums that, that, that were the understory of the, the, the tropical savannas. <coughs> and by curing later in the dry season, um, provides fuel for much, much hotter fires than the native grasses. So the, the, the terraforming geoengineering has, has, has succeeded, but perhaps not in the way we intended. But then moving on to the aesthetic phase, um, the Australian uh, examples are best, are well known in the literature here. So Richard Groves back in 97, looking at the, the nearly 2000 naturalized plants in Australia, showed that um, uh, the origin of those, 65% uh, had been introduced for ornamental purposes. They were horticultural um, nursery plants that had been introduced. So actually agriculture, agriculture's contribution there at 7% was far from the majority. Um, by the way, uh, a few years later, um, we did a, did a study of um, um, horticultural outlets and found that um, they were still selling um, uh, nine out of 36 species of plants that were in the world's 100 worst invasive species list. 72 of 178 listed noxious weeds were uh, widely available in horticultural outlets, nurseries and so on, and 10 of the 49 species that were affecting rare and endangered plants. So um, I want to now touch briefly on three major attributes of plant invasions, just to, uh, that, that, that seem important to me. The fact that plant invasions are everywhere, they affect multiple biomes, sectors and countries. This paper by uh, Van Kluden and colleagues in 2015 is a form of heat map. You can see um, uh, that southeastern Australia is, is uh, towards the high end. So is um, North America and Northern Europe. Um, there's over 13,000 plant species naturalized somewhere in the globe, 4% of the global vascular flora. North America's got the largest number of species um, established, although the Pacific Islands are showing the fastest increase. Um, <clears throat> but the continents of the Northern Hemisphere have been the major donors of species. So within that global array of species, there's some basic trends. Here's a paper uh, that I did looking at the, the sort of uh, the, the biogeography of this. But um, you can see here, this is a log log graph with a number of exotic plant species on the y-axis and the number of natives on the, on the, uh, on the x. <clears throat> and you can basically, you can explain 70% of the variance in the number of exotic species um, but with a, a, a multiple regression model uh, involving a number of native species which is presumably a surrogate for habitat diversity um, but you'll also find that you need to code for whether the site is an island site or a mainland site so at any given number of native species on the x-axis you'll have more invasives on islands and you will have um, more invasives on sites outside of reserves. So the top pair of lines are the islands, the bottom pair are the, are the mainland sites, and then within that, 
the dotted lines or the reserve sites and the solid, the non-reserve. So, so there's a sort of pattern of, um, of, of uh, underlying um, biogeography there that you can tease out from the, from the global data. Um, I, I don't think I was well able to tackle the concept of invasibility, which was my target when I did this paper. And I guess I, I don't have time to go into that now, but if you're interested, the, the anguished hand-wringing that I go through in the paper itself is worth, <laughs> is, is worth rereading even after 20 years. So, um, Okay, so another attribute that I want to talk about briefly is that successful invadive, invading plants are quite rare, typically maybe around 10% of introductions, which begs the question, how do weed risk assessment schemes achieve such high predictive power? Often people claim 80, 90% accuracy in their weed risk assessment schemes. Um, I don't really believe that's possible. Um, we did a study uh, some years ago on linking invasion prediction to, um, to the epidemiology of, of uh, mass screening for five minutes, mass screening for um, disease, and also for um, screening or test systems for detecting or predicting earthquakes. And we showed that um, there's, there's a lot of similarities between the fields that where you have incidents with low prevalence or low base rate, such as earthquakes, where they're actually quite rare events, your predictions of an earthquake or predictions of a disease are actually dominated by false positives. So again, I don't have time really to go into the detail of this, but um, I still think it's something that to me lurks behind uh, all these claims of very accurate weed risk assessment systems. And I think we need to take it on. A third attribute I want to talk about is just this lag phase issue that, that makes it so difficult to, um, to know uh, which is going to be the next problem weed. Uh, they often exhibit lag phases. So in Germany, there's a case study for trees uh, with 100 to 300 year lag phases. New Zealand weeds, 20 to 30 year lag phases. And then Peter Cayley analyzing the South Australian woody weed flora, um, arguing for about 150 years. So, so you can introduce things um, and nothing will happen for um, a good century or so. So um, what's going on there is, is, a, is, a, is a subject for another day, but uh, lots of interesting questions behind that. Um, now I'm going to broaden it a bit from plants to invasive alien species more broadly. So plants, plants and invasive pests and so on, because the literature doesn't really make a distinction in the IUCN. We talk about invasive alien species broadly uh, as having an impact. And you can see the impact is huge and threatening and plants, weeds are a major issue there. 51% of invertebrates globally are threatened, for example, by invasives. In the Anthropocene now, environments are changing faster than species ranges can keep up. And invasives are a key factor in biodiversity loss, as well as having economic and health impacts. So I really struggle with a book like this, which to me, um, I, I found my, myself quite shocked by, when this, by the, this book when it was published in 2015 by someone I've really admired over the years. Uh, the book's called The New Wild, and it talks about why invasive species will be nature's salvation. Now, a quote like this, nature's resilience is increasingly expressed in the strengths and colonizing abilities of alien species. They are often the new natives, and in the new wild, we need to stand back and applaud. And I, I just find this, uh, I mean, allowing for journalistic hyperbole, it sounds uh, almost deranged to me, but it... But it um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you can almost imagine this demanding Laban's round for the uh, for, for for invasive species. But it 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 um, I think we have to um, deal with this uh, head on because the uh, the arguments will gather strength as, as as ecosystems continue to change. I would argue that two minutes. invasive plants tend to produce monocultures that are going to be hard to break down. 
constructing new ecosystems isn't easy, as we know from mine site work. Um, managing invasives is a way of managing climate change. The climate change will be enacted through invasive species. So I'm going to reject triumphant defeatism and argue for a, an alternative that we should focus still and not give up the fight. We should understand the human factor in invasions, focus on solutions. There is a tendency in ecology to treat invasives as an interesting ecological phenomenon. I do think that now it has to be all hands to the pump uh, looking for solutions. We've got to know when to stop. Eradication campaigns often turn into a kind of Vietnam where people apply more and more uh, chemicals and, uh, and, and napalm and so on to, to try and um, stop and eradicate uh, a species when it would be better to spend the money elsewhere. Those kind of decisions are very hard to take. Um, and David Cook um, has argued for adopting a philosophy of adaptive governance with policy experimentation and a learning approach uh, to the foremost. So I can say that the world is catching on. When I was the chair of the Global Invasive Species Program 20 years ago, there were hardly any countries with legislation to do with invasive species. Now you can see from the purple um, countries on the map, those are countries with invasive species legislation. Uh, the, the lavender ones are, have, have elements of that, and the orange ones are, uh, uh, have, are discussing action towards invasives. So, so the HE 2020 target had, had as its indicator introducing that kind of legislation. Anyway, that brings me to the end. I just want to just recap, just to say I've talked about plant invasions being largely a result of intentional introductions, but they are everywhere. A small minority of plants is what we're dealing with uh, of, of, from the introductions. There's often a lag phase. I'm arguing that we should resist the defeatist talk um, of, of, um, of the new ecologists and try and understand the human factor when we design our management responses. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, great inspiration to uh, gird the loins and pass the glyphosate. <laughs> Give me something to do on Saturday. Our uh, last uh, brief presentation is uh, from uh, one of our honorary professors who's had a most distinguished career in both the United States uh, and Australia in terms of ecology. And in Australia, she has uh, worked for CSIRO in the tropics. And we're very fortunate to have her here at the Fenner School. Uh, not only is Pat uh, a great ecologist, but she's deeply appreciated around the school for her role in mentoring uh, many of our PhD scholars and, and assisting them despite the wayward efforts of uh, PhD supervisors like myself. <laughs> so Pat, thank you for all that you do and uh, we look forward to your uh, excellent presentation on tree population dynamics and biophysiognomy. I'll get it right anyway. <laughs> Pat, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you all for being here. Um, let's see, the word physiognomy has caused problems ever since I put it up. <laughs> it just means physical structure. I should have said that. Anyway, um, it's an important, let me see if I get all this straight first. I'll just click this. At the point is it here? I need instructions. Okay. So if I just hit it, it works? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Can't read can't read the top. Might be better at the very bottom. I don't know. Okay, that's all right. I'll just read it out anyway. Uh, anyway, physical structure is a very important um, component of any biome. And it affects many animals and especially small plants and ultimately the biodiversity of any site. 
in woodlands, it's often the largest woody species that are the main determinants of the site's um, physiognomy. So what determines the internal physical structure of those woody plants? Um, there are two different approaches. Uh, comparison studies, this is very common, um, especially in Australia, or longitudinal time studies, revealing population dynamics in, on specific sites. And that was my own approach ever since the early 70s when I did my PhD. So population dynamic studies, they're mostly on animals, you know, PVA, population viability analyses, and there's a uh, review of these in New Zealand not too long ago, and um, fewer than 5% of any of these population viability analysis studies were on plants. It's almost entirely animals. Well, why is that? We usually don't know the ages of the plants. Um, they're very plastic in their growth rates. Um, depends if, if sometimes they grow fast, sometimes they grow slow. Um, they're um, extremely um, difficult to apply population dynamics models to them. Um, so if we want to do a population dynamics model of plants to project into the future, especially trees, which are long lived, it's as bad as trying to do it on whales, for example. We can't wait around to see how long it's going to take for all the whales, big whales, or old whales to die off. We have to actually do something about finding out their survival, reproduction, etc., under different conditions, and then build models to project out into the future what's going to happen to them. Well, the same thing with trees. So the first thing we have to do is determine demographic parameters uh, and do that from field studies. And that's essentially um, the vital rates, number two there, for each life history status. That's survival, growth, reproduction, et cetera. And life history stages, of course, for plants, it's mostly based on size. Um, we don't know their ages, um, their habit. Um, by that, I mean, whether they're um, uh, biennials or perennials or what, and uh, phenology. Do they mostly grow um, fastest or use the resources around them different times of the year or whatever? So we have to determine these to define their life history stages in the first place, to come up with life history stages. All these, of course, under defined environmental conditions, and those may change. They could be abiotic, like fire or rainfall, they could be biotic, competition of river. So, um, here we go. Um, and as I mentioned, I was doing these kinds of things ever since the early 70s. But 1981, I came to Australia for the first time. Wow. <laughs> these populations, especially in the north, had all kinds of problems, especially the tree populations in fire, cyclones, you know, um, all kinds of disturbances. And um, that intrigued me as a population ecologist. You look at the upper left hand corner there. Um, especially up in the far north, where um, the previous speaker talked about um, working up in CSRO. And the average fire intervals there between fires is two compared to 100 years or more down in this part of the world. Up in the upper right hand corner, you see Kakadu National Park. This is 2015. Um, that's, those are the fires just in that one year. And of course, it's very strong monsoonal areas, so very strong wet dry seasons, lower left hand corner, you see the fires that occurred during that period. 95% of these fires in this region are set by humans. Okay, um, only about 5% are set by lightning. So, what we found, look on the left hand side, they're missing saplings. Well, that again intrigued me. And the question, I mean, does something happen to reduce the saplings, or is this very natural as part of a trajectory of irreversible change, what's going on? So from, from 1982 onward, I did this from Michigan State actually and on sabbatical leave at first. Um, for about 30 years after that, um, great field crews and I monitored the appearance of uh, more, almost 5,000 um, juvenile and sapling trees that we monitored for the next nine years in the first instance and about 3,000 adult trees of the, of the canopy species and followed them. And um, we also did a lot of little experiments. We um, manipulated um, the understory by clipping, just find out whether the herbivores, the buffalo, were having no effect. It turns out actually the trees, small trees grew faster when the buffalo were there 
Um, that's because we're moving the competitors around them because we did it by clipping. We are moving the competitors, same thing. So we did a lot of kinds of studies like that at the time, the role of competition, the role of herbivory in the early stages. But then as we um, got more information and we wanted to build a population model, we took all of our understory species and we really narrowed them down to two types for, so that we could work with it a little bit easier. And these two understory types were essentially that annual grass, sorghum, that um, Dr. Lonsdale spoke about. Uh, it's native and it's an annual, um, and also everything else, non-sorghum. Um, a little juvenile tree doesn't care who it's being competed <laughs> with, really, or being overshadowed by. I mean, it doesn't care the species. It just needs to know the size and shape and when it uh, grows the best. And so we were able to combine those. And at that time, we didn't have gamma grass or other invasive large perennial African grasses in um, Kakadu anyway. We did our work mostly in Kakadu and the CSRO site at Kapalga there. Okay, and we also did, did the role of the fire season. And there we did early dry season, late dry season, and wet season. These were done before the CSRO fire experiment, which started much later. But we did our own experimental fire work then. Okay, so just quickly look at the pictures here on the left hand side. The, Sorghum understory, this is in the wet season, upper left, and um, that's on the roadside, so it's a little bit taller than usual, but usually it's about as tall as me. Okay, and then if you go down, you can see the early dry season. That grass dries off really early. It does not compete with the juvenile trees that are really do their most growing um, a little bit later. However, it does provide the major fuel load. Okay, so that's the grass. On the upper right side, you see the non-sorghum understory, that's very typical like that, and that's in the wet season. And the dry early dry season, it still hasn't browned off like the sorghum has. And it does compete with these juvenile trees. Okay, and it stays, they stay green pretty much through the dry season as well. So, um, and here just quickly, early dry season fires, they're low, uh, don't get into the canopy, and they're patchy and late dry season fires are um, usually pretty well cover, you know, almost everything. They're not really patchy. So um, over the years then we had to learn about the biology of these plants so that we could build a population model in the first place. We had to learn about the environment and the main things that affect them. Um, and then from that we were able to build, since we didn't have ages, we built stages. Okay, and it just wasn't big, pre-reproductive, reproductive, et cetera. It was something like this. Okay, and this is the three dominant um, species collectively. This is what we use for our population because there weren't many differences, and not statistical differences between them in growth or survival or anything like that. And we lumped them together. They form 90% um, of the sub-adults and 85% of the adults of these forests um, are these three species. So, these stages here, life history stages, we got eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you look over on the right hand side, um, you'll see that the small juveniles and the large juveniles are essentially deciduous. That's why you miss them when you first walk out there in the middle of the dry season. You've got sticks sticking up, okay? But they've dropped their leaves. They, they right after the sorghum dries off, then they reproduce like mad. They store everything underground. They've got great big lignotubers underground. And they don't try to grow higher. They just don't. They just drop their leaves and wait for another year. Okay? And then, continuing to follow them, five minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> i got to get to the model oh, yet. <laughs> 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 I'll try to talk faster. I'm going to leave up with just model results. Okay. Okay, the small saplings, anyway, um, this is where they finally head for the canopy. They take all that stored food underground and they, make a, they start growing like mad as fast as they can. Well, it's also the two things. One is it's the only, they're semi deciduous, but it's the only stage where we get water stress um, in the leaves. And that's um, Derek Emus and Linda Pryor's work. And um, I called them, they make a run for it essentially. It's also very sensitive to any kind of fires at all. And I call them teenagers. In other words, they're just trying to become adults and they just are very uh, vulnerable anyway. Okay, so 
height in the beginning and switch to DPH or diameter after that. Okay, so here are the stages on the top, and you can see that these are the movements between them, and sometimes they go backwards, especially if you get burnt down or whatever, and then you come back, or you survive that way. So those are the stages on the top. And the bottom is a transition matrix. This across the top, for example, this, this is um, calculated from these 30 years worth of field data, and it essentially shows the transition from um, stages on the top, from those stages to the bottom stages. Look at number three on the top there. 14% um, probability really of getting smaller, 50% probability of staying in the same stage, going up, et cetera. The bottom line is the mortality, okay? So these, um, we produce one of these matrices for every fire season and understory, um, and we had to make some assumptions like use 50% patchiness in the, in the, in the um, early dry, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so then, Using these transition matrices, we built with Stephanie Peacock, who is um, here in um, 2017 as a postdoc working with David Lindemeyer, um, stage based matrix uh, population models published in this <coughs> year. And we project the probability of long term persistence of the canopy tree populations first with no fire. We had all the data from the we had transition matrix for that, with annual fires or we did 10 simulated fire regimes, um, including one of them, which is a decade-long pattern that was found in Kakadu National Park. We also did transition analyses, which allowed us to follow uh, over time um, what the size structure of the physiognomy looked like. Okay, here we go. Um, I think we can skip this one. Um, it's the mathematics of it, but essentially a uh, new statistic, it's, it's uh, lambda anyway. Here's a modeling result, the first one. We won't go into the result, just the conclusion. Essentially, if we have no fires at all, the population is um, goes to extinction on that side. Okay. And the second conclusion, the populations are, okay, we run fires every single year, early fires or late fires, every single year. Again, they go to extirpation, they die out. Okay, well, what combination, the sequence of fire years, um, and no fire years. And so we came up with some fire regimes that we tried. You try other fire regimes. And let's just skip to the bottom one there, mixed regime. And we did this uh, for different kinds of uh, fire timing, et cetera. Let's skip some of that. Let's just go straight to that fire regime. More results. Okay, that, that one. For this one, um, you see, this is on the bottom, the conclusion. The eucalyptus tree canopy population experience is most common modern day, by modern day I mean since about the 70s. Fire regime in Kakadu National Park has about less than 30% probability of long-term persistence, okay, if it's continued. And here's using the transition analysis, can't see the top there. Um, you can see what happens at the upper right is one year we start with a stable size distribution. We, st we also started with other distributions. The next one down is about the 1980s and you'll see here you'll see here that um, got lots of big trees. As you come down here these juveniles and the saplings are actually getting fewer. The next one down is probably about now. In another 30 to 40 years you'll see this here. Not as many trees at all. Lots of these things. But once these trees die, you have no more seedlings. Okay? So it does go to local extinction. Okay. This is a picture. Uh, that's the first one on the upper left. I showed you that picture in the very beginning. That's 1984. I took that picture myself, aerial photography near Ripley Point. The one on the right, 2018, is from Google Earth. And um, the current Kakadu plan of management does not name the tall open forest as an area of concern um, at all. Now, why is that? Well, people last maybe five, ten years working up there, and they see trees. What's the problem? And I think probably we don't have enough 
photos or people that are old enough to recall what it used to look like 40 years ago. Mark here is <laughs> nodding. He knows what I'm talking about here. Okay, and one last one is all. Um, I can go into that more about why I think that the National Park is pretty well ignoring this problem. If these go, by the way, the animals go as well. Um, Phil Nick lizards, um, birds that use the trees, da, 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 da. those are already declining and there are little workshops about why the mammals are declining you know, up in the park. It's not the cats, they've been there for almost 200 years. Okay, last one, I just want to say we did model experiments you can do with this model, it's generalizable. Um, we've been doing some of these already, you're modifying patch sizes, modifying recruitment rates. You can even do it uh, modifying um, increased growth maybe with carbon dioxide under climate change. Anything that modifies a transition matrix um, and you know the data from how it affects the stages of these plants, you can use this model for that. Sure. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that wonderful exposition on physiognomy. <laughs> so, uh, really quite concerning for the future of Kakadu. Uh, now, we will have some discussion for questions. Peter, are you able to remay the questions? Yeah, I can. Discuss? And I might even Fantastic. turn down and we can have our panellists to sit up here. Indeed. Shall we give them a microphone or are you going to take that? I will. Excellent. We have the technology. So, we are running a little late. So I'm assuming there's nobody else coming in here next. No, so, we can okay. run over a little <laughs> in our erudite discussion. So, uh, I will take uh, questions for a further 10 15 minutes. Who would like to start with a wonderful question for our panel? Yes. Mark, um, I confess. I confess in front of this audience that I'm attracted to the, the dark side of transit defeatism. Um, <laughs> can you please offer me some hope to drag me back from the dark side? Um, yes, I, th I, th I mean, it's clear that if we, thank you, if, if we put the effort in, we can um, turn the tide with these with these species. If we had a national information system, and that would help um, with access issues as well. If we had a national information system that told us how our ecosystems were going and what the threats were in real time. Um, if we spend money on biocontrol, um, biocontrol of weeds, and if we um, protect our ecosystems from disturbance, um, we can we can actually turn the tide back. And there are other sorts of innovations that I'd like to like to see us exploring. Things like um, early detection of um, the next cab off the rank, as it were. And so so uh, sentinel sites that would monitor uh, invasive species for those that are. Um, uh, uh, upturning in, 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 um, in abundance. I just think that the alternative is, ca is chaos. It's not, it's not some easy solution, the, the, the kind of thing that Fred Pierce is, is talking about. It, it is ecosystems that would be unrecognizable, would be unsustainable. It's not clear that, um, uh, what, what we know very well, for, as I mentioned, from my site we have it's not that easy to get a, a self-sustaining um, ecosystem um, established. So, the, what you know, what is the alternative? The alternative is chaos. And so, perhaps I haven't given you hope, but I certainly want to give you a kick up the bum and say, come over <laughs> to the the bright side again and help us not not um, you know not turn to eco-fascism. I mean, is that too? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. We have a question online from Matt Shard, uh, and his question is for Sue. Can I, is it possible to answer that question to get the, my second last slide? Second last slide for Sue? Yeah. Oh, sorry, mate. That'd be great. So I'll read out this question for those online. 
So I'm just going to read that expression for the next one. Oh, right. Okay. I think I'm going back. Yeah, okay. Question for Sue. How do you think the benchmark measures you selected uh, for Sydney have been altered by both feral and native herbivores, which would alter tree succession? Do you think that the benchmark uh, levels should actually be higher or lower with regard to larger standing, greater than 30 centimetre uh, DBH trees, to better reflect post colonial levels? Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Matt. That's a very complicated question to answer in the circumstances. But firstly, about the feral one, I don't get any sense that um, the trees are being affected by uh, either macropods. We don't have rabbits, I haven't seen a lot of rabbit damage. The hares. Uh, so I don't think that the that ferals are an issue. Um, the, um, the other question is about, should we have more, uh, more of these in the, oh, sorry, it's a very complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> but I so think, the question so this, is whether there should be more of the larger trees. Yeah, so this um, blue number three there, that's actually the figure from Benson and Red Path, which they estimated from historical um, values, the, and I probably didn't have time to talk about that, the uh, structure of a woodland based on um, historical accounts. And so, and, and so I think actually it's about right. If, if anything, I'd say the uh, benchmarks here are a bit light touch in terms of um, numbers of trees, remembering that, that all the um, lower sizes are growing and maturing as well. Uh, so essentially, uh, I don't think that, um, and given that you can't cut the larger trees, I just don't think that's, that there is, uh, there's possibly going to be, I think the forests are going to essentially still be fully stocked under these regimes, basically. So thank you. Uh, Matt, a question for you. Let me have the microphone mm -hmm. over. Uh, thanks all of you for great talks. And my question is to Pat, and you, you talked about 30% likelihood or less of persistence of trees that can be under existing fire regimes. So what's the role, if any, of indigenous fire management in changing that trajectory. Um, well, first of all, I think we have to look at, like, okay, um, what is actually done, even under Aboriginal planning. And I'm giving you going out on a limb here, but the current management is not traditional Aboriginal planning. Sure. Um, first of all, traditionally didn't use helicopters, um, didn't go back and re-burn the patches that don't burn in early biosphere, and now go back and re-burn areas that didn't burn, you know, the patches, or, you know, et cetera. That's the only way that these juvenile and sapling trees can escape, right? Um, there are some incentives currently to burn um, I don't want to get into the politics of the, all of this right now, but um, uh, fire money, um, carbon offsets. In other words, the idea is if you burn early, there, there's less carbon release than if a late fire is going to get away from you. And that difference between the carbon released in late fires with early fires is used as carbon credits, which are bought by for private companies and encouraged by the federal government. Excellent, thanks. Uh, further questions for our speakers today? Any comments or questions? Those online are really no. welcome to um, hold some up. Yes, indeed, John. Uh, so, question I think from Mark. Uh, so, your figures about the number of weeks that have come in, the, the vast majority of them have come in through uh, 
effectively nursery stock uh, for what metal purposes or for that sort of thing. Is that rate of introduction through the nursery process as great now as it has been in the past? And is this like an easy win in terms of uh, we restrict that practice that we can minimise the number of new leads coming in? That's a good question. We don't we don't really um, easily we, we don't easily get um, an up to the minute answer for that on, on that kind of um, introduction rate. It's obvious now to me that the horticultural industry is taking it more seriously. That the industry codes of practice that have slowed the uh, slowed the process. The weed risk assessment system that we have in place also helps to slow uh, the process. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a very long process of assessment because there's only a few people that can do it. Um, that tends to mean if you want to bring in a new species that isn't uh, currently in the country, it has to go through a fairly labyrinth like process to come in. So in the end, the, 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 the rate of introduction must be, must be slowing. And the industry has got these past examples of disasters in front of it, so you do have these codes of practice in place. Um, but as for as for being quantitative about it, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't. Great question. Further question on the format. All right, I'll go to Phil. Thank you. Um, great talk, everyone. It was fabulous. Pat, I have a question for you. I guess I know you didn't want to get into the politics of stuff, and I'm not really asking you to, but I guess, um, you know, it's kind of sad to see that uh, that last image where we might not be having the trees. So if you were to speak to the minister, you know, or any of the land managers there, what would you say about how to change the management up in that area to improve um, the ecosystem up there? We just have to say first, um, the fires are set for a number of reasons. For example, we've got a built environment up there in parts of Kakadu now. So protection of the built environment should be a separate issue from the protection away from the built environment. I showed the conservation mode, really. Um, I could have showed you also one of the built environments which shows nice and green all around the buildings and then outside of that it looks just like the uh, 2018 photo I showed you. But the rest of the Kakadu shouldn't look like that. Maybe around the built environments. Okay, so I would uh, first of all say we have to separate and drive by regions as to what we want and manage for uh, what we want, not manage the fire behavior in those many sectors. So manage for the end product. That's the first thing I would say. For example, get rid of sulfur as much as possible. Sulfur dies out under trees. You know, we need trees. We've got more sulfur. So we've got higher fires. So, you know, there are lots of little things that we can say about managing those two for different purposes. We'll take another two or three questions and then wrap up. I'll just run the microphone back to Phil. In fact, Pete's going to run the microphone back to Phil. But it's a sort of observation, really, because we've been modelling, as you know, Pat, um, uh, we're doing some more work at the moment, modelling the future of mature trees in intensively managed landscapes, and this, this time we're doing it on forestry. And you know, all the intensively managed landscapes we've modelled, the mature trees are just declining. You know, uh, because of, and one thing that really worries me, I don't know if you've got anything to say about this, is prescribed burning five year intervals in southern Australia. You know, from our modelling, it, it, it's driving down mature trees over time. So uh, I don't know if you've got any comments, comments on that, you know, given the similarity with your system. And, and also, Sue, I, I think um, in one thing that we find is if you can accelerate the rate at which trees form mature resources like hollows then that's a really important thing to do to stop us having a period where we have this huge bottleneck of you know low mature tree resources before that starts to come back so i think 
what you're doing, I think, is an excellent, an excellent idea. And given that I'm involved in the Australian, um, you know, farm stewardship program, I'll make sure that pennies back in, <laughs> back in there are placed on your tour. So thank you. Excellent. I think Pete's just going to run the microphone back so we can get some responses. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, I agree. Most places don't have heard too much, essentially, in the areas. But to convince people otherwise, you really have to have the data on what happens to the juvenile and sapling trees under those fires. And <coughs> trees are going fine for low replacement trees or low canopy trees. But I suspect they're not going fine. They're not going down. The smaller trees and the big trees are not being replaced. By the way, I just mentioned that I'm old enough to remember going out with some of the Aboriginal folks that are now gone and watching the fires and, and how they did things. And no way, even regardless of other factors, as far as when you burn or where you burn, you're not doing that at all. So did you want to follow on from Phil at all? Okay. Uh, next comment or question. One more from that. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about nutrients, particularly the phosphorus, as, as a bit of a bottleneck for, for restoration. Um, I'm wondering, you know, this has been an issue that's been around ever since you your work on phosphorus gradients and so on. And I'm wondering whether there have been any advances there on restoration techniques of phosphorus sequestration by particular <clears throat> understory plants or experimentation with that kind of thing. Can you comment on how you get over the phosphorus bottleneck? <clears throat> yes, it's interesting, Matt, isn't it, that um, that that issue has not really been addressed mm -hmm. at all. Um, time is the only um, uh, factor that, that kicks in that we, we know well that I've heard of. Um, some sort of acceleration, uh, there doesn't, no one seems to have come up with one, but nor have I seen many people really recognise it as a problem. Yeah. Um, it's really strange. I'll say one more thing about Bill, about the fire every five years. One of the things we did in our model was to have fires occur at a certain time, deterministic, every five years we're going to do it, versus on average every five years. So 20% of the time, you know, the of time. And when you do it stochastically, time, you have a better chance of higher um, probability of, of um, the population persisting. Do we have any last question before I wrap up? Yes, down the back. Thank you. Thank you all for the really, really interesting talks. And I guess it, it's a bit of a thought that I've had listening to all three of them, and I was so interested to get your opinions on it. But in a lot of ways, one of the things I see in conservation generally through the talks is that we like to think of ourselves as separate from the environment, and then um, we do conservation, we create reserves, and we're not in them, and we'll have ecosystems, and if we don't interfere, they'll rehabilitate and manage themselves, and we'll all be fine. Um, and I think it comes a lot to that defeatist sort of attitude of, well, the weeds are there now, and if the system can't cope with them, that's not our fault, we'll, we're hands off. Um, and I also want to get your opinion on whether we should be doing more to explain to people that we're part of the system and change that perception that we're actively altering systems whether we need to or not and we need to be, as I said, managing them for an outcome. We want to store in the system, we want them to look like this. We need to have a path to get there rather than just say, it's all, no thing, we fine. Great integrative question to finish off with. Who would like to read? <coughs> Yeah, this is an issue quite close to my heart. I think, um, Linda, the ecologists are actually their own worst enemy in this one. And I think a lot of the hands-off uh, attitude that really is very strong, uh, particularly in the sort of um, nature conservation reserve management area, is based on the hangover from the wilderness concept. 
and the hangover from oncologists having done a few really stupid things in the past, like you know, try and introduce mallee fowl to um, Wilson's palm tree, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I don't think it's the public that needs convincing, I think it's ecologists that need convincing, quite frankly. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really interesting question because it, it, it reminded me of um, how in the in the 80s um, with uh, Kakadu National Park it, there was this sense that now it's a park everything will be okay and of course the invasive species um, suddenly make you realize that that's not the case that the, 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 the borders of the park aren't recognized by, by these species and so from the mindset of managing a national park for um, for invasives, it, it was largely treated at first as a hygiene issue and a minor, you know, it would be the um, the job of the lowliest um, um, park ranger to deal with weed control, as opposed to really needing a, 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 a park scale strategic agenda to manage invasive species and to be reaching out um, to the primary industries department to say stop introducing um, yet more species into the system and to organize um, aerial spraying regimes that then require placating conservationists that the use of herbicides in a national park has to be done, uh, otherwise we're going to lose everything. All of that stuff. Um, you know, parks in the real world and, and setting up a park does not um, mean you can stop uh, thinking about the environment as uh, connected to all the influence we have. Yeah. These two did such a good job on that answer. Um, there are other people in the room who work at the Kakadu in the north. Um, who are you now? Just Okay. Um, and I just wanted to just mention that. Do you remember the Mimosa Hit Squad? Yes. Yeah. It was in Kakadu of the Mimosa Hit Squad for a while. Well, they, they were, they yeah. were they, there was an outbreak of Mimosa in the National Park. And instead of being able to manage it as, as, as a, just a hygiene issue, we then needed long term team who knew where the sites of outbreak were and were repeatedly going back to these sites over, I think it was a period of at least 20 years. So uh, to 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 extirpate the city bank. So a classic example of of long term strategic management, which is what's required to get on top of the issue. With that, uh, we should uh, wind up. Uh, thank you for staying on because I think it's been a a rich uh, discussion. Uh, I think that this uh, thematic. Uh, seminar has been a great success in that we've had nearly 40 people participate in person online. So I think for those of us in the affiliates committee, we will contemplate doing this again soon. But let me uh, thank uh, Pat, Sue and Mark for fabulous and thought provoking talks. I'm about to ask Sue for a copy of her little table to apply elsewhere. I thought that was fantastic. And can I also thank Pete and the other FENA admin staff for supporting the seminar so well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.